a cup of water. <laughs> oh, no, nope, it's going, it's going dry. Okay. All right. Well, we are officially live on Facebook. I want to thank everyone for joining us and Will Cunningham. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, tonight we have a really special uh, conversation plan. I'm, I've been excited about this for for weeks now because I'm just like hopefully most of you all are. I am reading um, the drowning of well, that's a bad glare. There you go, <laughs> the drowning of Money Island, um, and I am super excited for our guest tonight, Andrew Lewis. Um, you know, when we talk about these issues, it's always really in, important, um, I think, to have local face and local stories tied to them. Um, and when I discovered uh, Andrew's book and that he was from my home county, basically went to a rival high school, um, I was I was really excited and made it a point to reach out to him. Um, and it's this has sort of been like a, a grassroots movement to make this make tonight happen because the book was given to me while I was an, in Cape May at an event, a campaign event, a supporter just kind of slid the book to me. He's like, do you, do you know about this? Do you, want, do you want to borrow my book? And so I said, absolutely. And so that's how tonight came to be. Um, but you know, we, it's important in South Jersey that we talk about these issues. Um, and I want to continue to, in our series of um, you know, things that are important to our community now, things that, should be taken uh, more seriously and be a priority because they will matter even more in the future. Um, this, is, this is our first uh, virtual town hall discussion that's not specifically about the pandemic. Um, and I know that's still sort of top of mind for everyone and it still is obviously the, the national priority um, and public health priority. Um, but tonight's conversation is going to pivot a little bit and talk about climate change as the looming crisis that was here before COVID and unfortunately will be here far for after. Um, so with that, I want to give Andrew, our guest, a uh, moment to introduce himself. And um, he's one of us, South Jersey. Welcome him. <laughs> well, <clears throat> thank you, Will. And, and thank you for, for everyone for, for joining tonight. Um, as Will mentioned, I, I am from, from South Jersey, born and raised. My family goes back uh, a lot of generations, actually. We, we grew up in the, the, the Fairton, um, Hopewell Township area, and I, you know, I spent my days as a kid on the Bay Shore, uh, in the marshes, and fishing on the bay, and and um, really just being steeped in in the sort of the the rural lifestyle that that we have down here in South Jersey, uh, which is actually quite unique, uh, especially when compared to the way that a lot of people imagine New Jersey to be. So. Uh, <laughs> As I say, when I talk about the book, it's always uh, special to be able to, to talk about it in front of a, a South Jersey audience and, and folks who are from South Jersey because sometimes we get, we get left out of the conversation. So uh, obviously that was an inspiration. Uh, being left out of the conversation was an inspiration for writing the book and uh, you know, having this chance to, to talk tonight is, is just fantastic. Nice. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting because you're describing sort of a double exclusion, right? It's like the global national conversation about, about climate change. And then specifically within New Jersey, South Jersey, usually not being a part of, uh, you know, prioritized um, as we're seeing with, you know, some of the pandemic and the testing sites and things of that nature. But, you know, this is, some may think this is an, an odd time to have this conversation in the middle of this crisis, but I, I, I make the complete opposite argument in that, um, we're seeing so many parallels um, to the devastation that could occur with climate change and which communities would be most impacted and sort of the inequities that exist in our country. And um, as that presents itself in a very economic and racial way, um, before we go further, I want to encourage everyone um, to ask questions throughout. Um, we, we're, we're going to be here until seven and we'll, we'll definitely answer questions throughout the, the conversation, especially as it pertains to um, our discussion, which is going to sort of start broadly about climate change, gradually funnel to talk more about New Jersey, South Jersey specific issues, um, and, and then the book itself. And if anyone has been reading the book along with me, um, we're going to dig into some of the, the first half of the book. Um, and if you're Erwin, and I wanted to make this first conversation broad based so that when we hopefully have another conversation in May, it'll be entirely about the book and it'll be a discussion with so everyone who's read it and it won't just be Andrew and I speaking. <laughs> um, but that's sort of our, our run of show tonight. Um, and with that, I want to just go back to, you know, it, I think it's an important moment and Andrew, I, I think you would agree to have this conversation um, 
because our country was caught flat-footed with this pandemic and what we've seen what occurs uh, nationally when a crisis uh, catches this country off guard. Um, so I think it's important for us to be prepared and have these conversations. Um, this isn't a necessarily a new urgency, that's, but, uh, but it's something that we have to renew um, because the stakes are so high. Um, you know, there are various, you know, statistics and studies and things of that nature. And, and Andrew, before we jumped on live, we were just talking about the, the national climate assessment um, and, you know, their recent finding that if, if no action is taken, if the country just pro progresses on its current trajectory of inaction on climate change, it will cost our, our economy half a trillion dollars every year until 2090. The devastation, the lost revenue, you name it. Um, and so I know as a climate journalist, sort of how does that strike you and sort of, uh, you know, how, what urgency does that give your, your work even more so? Well, I mean, first of all, I think I should just point out that in the last couple of weeks, I've been doing reporting on the coronavirus uh, pandemic in New Jersey. And it does, you know, it does feel a lot <laughs> like climate change reporting, especially this week. I've been working on a story about the fishing industry in New Jersey and how that's been devastated. And, and I don't think it takes too much thought to to think about, you know, how climate change is, is potentially going to, you know, devastate the fishing industry. So I, I think th there are so many clues in, in what we're dealing with right now um, with the coronavirus pandemic that, that point to the to the things that we're going to have to face in the future with climate change. I mean, it, the number of, of, you know, half a trillion dollars by 2090, that, that's striking. But, you know, even, even sooner than now, and looking at, at the projections for, say, sea level rise, for example, um, even on the low end, even if we just set aside for a moment that the worst case scenarios that are, that are being published a lot, if we look on the low end, by 2050, um, we're looking at an average of, of eight more inches on top of the high tide level that we see here in South Jersey, um, you know, at every high tide. So that's eight inches. That's the low end. That, and then it could go up even within that low average to moderate average to two feet. So just imagine the, the, the surge that we had with Hurricane Sandy that's, that's cost the state billions and billions and billions of dollars. If that surge had gone, just think of it as two extra feet further inland. Um, you know, it's more devastation. Yeah, it's, it's more devastation. It's more money, and it's almost incomprehensible to think of the the, the price tag um, of inaction. You know, and I just and going back to the to the coronavirus pandemic, um, I just worry that um, you know we we are sort of making some mistakes over and over again with regard to you know, not thinking about the future, you know, we're just trying to rush and, mm -hmm. and address the problem straight away. And of course, yes, we need to do that with regard to the, our healthcare workers. Um, but there are some other things within our economy that definitely require taking a deep breath and thinking about and, you know, embedding in, in the legislation that comes out to, to provide aid that is looking at the next 100 years and, and how to mitigate disasters because at the end of the day the coronavirus is a natural disaster just like uh, a hurricane is a natural disaster yeah and i think that 2050 sort of measure in time is important and because it signifies the paris climate agreement and sort of what our country hadn't originally agreed to that we've since pulled out of um but you see countries like uh, south korea and obviously the eu um you know, they've made their commitments to lower their carbon emissions to zero by 2050. That was initially something that I did, uh, the, our country had agreed to do in 2015, and we reversed course. Um, similar to, you know, the, the pandemic response team that we had until we didn't have it anymore. Um, and sort of having these, these sort of, they're not micro, but these sort of things that don't seem like they matter when they happen, when they occur, we've seen it have devastating consequences within two years from 2018, the pandemic response team no longer existing. And we're seeing in 2015 that the Paris climate agreement, and now we aren't abiding by it. I mean, and it, it's, I know some will say, oh, the simple solution is just having a democratic president get us back in. 
and then what do we just repeat the cycle which in which we have a republican who comes along eight years 10 12 years after that and takes us out again um i mean it's and you're right it does require to take a deep breath <laughs> it's it's a lot to, t to take in and, I, and you know for me you know one of the reasons my campaign has prioritized this issue the end of environment and climate change is because and we'll talk about this a bit more but the message matters right and the, the message the messenger sometimes matters more than the message some of the opposition we'll see and this this comes up in the book too um that we'll get to that um but you know if my sort of how I felt about how this is kind of viewed in South Jersey, and this is what I say on the campaign trail, this can't just be a, an affluent white issue of beach, of beach homeowners. Um, people of all backgrounds, races, economic um, levels have to really understand the urgency of it um, and that which communities will be hardest hit. And we've sort of seen that with this pandemic, you know, who's getting tests first, who's able to go to their second homes, like this, those kind of, uh, escape routes don't exist for a large swath of the population. <laughs> um, yeah. And so there's, there's a lot more parallels than I think um, are sort of immediately come to mind. But I want to talk about the rising, the rising sea levels. Um, because right now, I think I know I saw another stat and um, one and a quarter inch a year right now is the, is the rate. Is that sound accurate to you, Andrew? Of uh, levels? It, it and depends on it depends on where you're where you're looking at in the world uh it's i think it's about if i can speak to the bay shore i think it's about a quarter of an inch a year yeah yeah it's the taller bay shore so that would be relatively the same over on the atlantic coast and so how do you see the role of, i mean obviously global warming is is have is impacting that but is there is there a level by which it becomes a reversible sort of the if we don't take action then we are on this irreversible track toward just a exponential rising sea levels. Well, it's a really it's a really good question. It's a really good point, and it goes back to the the twenty fifty example I, I gave earlier. Uh, I was having a really good conversation with uh, Michael Oppenheimer at Princeton uh, a couple months back, and um, we were talking about that twenty fifty number. We were talking about that average of about eight inches to two feet by twenty fifty. And I sort of ended the conversation. I said, yes, right, of course. And that's, you know, if we, um, you know, continue along business as usual. And he stopped me and he was very sort of firm about it. He was like, no, even if we turn off the tap tomorrow, what's baked in to the, into the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide, we are still going to um, be looking at eight inches to two feet of rise by 2050. So it's, it's, it's already too late for that. So, I mean, so, so when we talk about this, we're talking about, since we're talking in parallels to the pandemic, almost a flattening of the rise, like a flattening yeah. of the curve. Yeah. It, it's, it's almost exactly the same. It's like right now we are, um, say maybe two weeks ago with regard to the pandemic where it was sort of all hands on deck um, where we have to flatten this curve. Of course. Governor Murphy says we have to crush the curve. Um, <laughs> Break the back, I think. <laughs> yeah. Crush the curve. It's <laughs> a favorite phrase. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's exactly, that's exactly where we are, where, you know, we can't stop it from going up right now with regard to sea level rise. But we can, if we take steps, we can, we can slow the curve. And really, um, you know, we can't stop all disasters by slowing or crushing the curve, but we can certainly mitigate for a better future. And, you know, I think, I think we have to think of it that way right now. I think uh, maybe it's, it's too hyperbolic to say we're in a triage situation because I don't think we're quite there yet. Mm -hmm. But I do think that we have to, um, you know, start thinking of it like we're in emergency. Uh, obviously, Greta Thunberg has done a good job of, of like making it feel as if we are in emergency with, with the youth of the world. And that's important because I think so many, um, you know, politicians and, and policymakers around the world have just not thought about it um, as if we were in an emergency. And, and it's a really good point. I mean, you could, you could think of this, the climate crisis as the, the coronavirus crisis and, and crushing the curve. It's, it's almost the identical sort of mm -hmm. philosophical way to look at it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, 
the parallel, I mean, I, I've been kind of astounded you know, in, in preparation for, um, for this conversation and looking at and the articles that have come up. It's not, this isn't sort of just like a, you and I didn't just discover this is parallel. <laughs> this is, there's a national dialogue about there being a parallel because it's, it's like starkly apparent. Um, you know, and I encourage anyone to, um, who hasn't already, um, one of the authors of the Green New Deal uh, wrote an op-ed for New York Times over the weekend that was fantastic. She's, she's one of its little known, the Green New Deal was partially written by um, an African-American environmental scholar. And she is the, the, the woman who wrote this op-ed. And, you know, when I talk about these issues, it's, it's from the, the voice of needing a, a person of color to really get home the urgency in those communities. Um, and so, you know, I think it's, I encourage everyone to read that article, but also there is that, you know, we're, we're seeing uh, sort of our government's back is against the wall and our crisis is giving no, and not allowing anything but action at this point. We have to do something about it. and for me, you know, we, we'd be remiss not to, I don't think it's political, it's not political, it's not partisan to bring this up as a solution to sort of what, as we rebuild our economy. And, and so I want to get your thoughts on, on that, because I believe that we're going to need, and this is what the op-ed in the New York Times also stated, we're going to need an economic response that's as severe and as serious and as large as the devastation. Um, anytime you've had anything in American history that's sort of, um, taken down the economy in this in such a way that we currently are experiencing and have had in the Great Depression and other eras, we've had literally the Great Deal, the, the, the New Deal after the Great Depression, and we have the Green New Deal potentially after this COVID pandemic. And um, so how does that strike you, Andrew? Well, I mean, I think, so we, we just talked about the, the, the striking similarity between, you know, the sea level rise climate change curve and the, and the coronavirus curve. But at the same time, there's a, there's a, there's a big difference between the, the, the pandemic and, and climate change. And that's simply the fact of um, time, right? This has all happened in a, in a mind-blowingly uh, compressed amount of time, right? It, we, you know, two months ago, we could have never expected that, that you and I would be having this, this <laughs> panel you know, on Zoom, but here we are. Um, unfortunately, we don't have that that um, compression of fear with climate change. It's 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 a slower moving crisis. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take um, it's going to take foresight a, l a little more than just sort of reactivity that's that's happening with this pandemic. Uh, you know, it's going to have to take people uh, to 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 be thinking uh, far more forward. You know, as opposed to just reacting as we are now. Um, certainly. Um, it's every, every death in this pandemic is, is, is a tragedy and, and it's, it's terrible. And like I said, I've been reporting about it for the last four weeks and it's, it's, it's really a horrific thing to write, to report on. Um, but there's no doubt that that element of fear, um, that, that we have with this crisis has, has pushed us, uh, in the way that it has with regard to, you know, aid packages and, 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 politicians coming together. And unfortunately, that, that's not something that we can, we can get with a climate crisis. So again, it, it takes uh, forward thinking heads. Uh, and, and, you know, actually, I think that's happening. I think we, we see it. I always like to bring up the, the example of uh, Matt Gates in Florida. Um, such an interesting, oh, Matt such Gates. interesting <laughs> subject. The first, the first piece of legislation he put through when he got to, to Congress was to abolish the EPA, right? And now he's, and now he's on, um, you know, he's, he's a loud voice for um, climate change and, you know, getting, mm -hmm. getting lawmakers to come together on climate change. And, and that in and of itself is, is definitely sort of mind boggling, but it is a hint that there is hope. You know, uh, he doesn't see um, the Green New Deal as, as the viable way. And I think some of his, his um, ideas for his own version of the Green New Deal, you know, or maybe fall short in some ways. But, but at the end of the day, um, and I write about a lot of this in the book, you know, just Republicans and Democrats and where they can come together and, mm -hmm. you know, where their ideas come from. Um, in Matt Gates of all people, I, I see 
you know, hope for a some kind of. <laughs> can, uh, maybe you say that again. You can like, you know, someone can like get a snippet and send that to him because I don't know if, if anyone ever says that about Malcolm X. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that I, gives, I see hope. Okay. <laughs> I, I just, I, you know, I see, I see Republicans turning a corner. Um, yeah, I hope so. With regard to climate change, and I guess that's what I'm saying with regard to this crisis is that mm -hmm. it, it's going to take um, both both parties to come together and, and, and you know. And make yeah, I know, and we talked about this a bit because, you know, it, it's on a global level, you see country, you see South Korea, you see the EU, they're using this as, um, you know, they, they wanna be responsive to the, the new economy that they will have to build after this pandemic. And they're, see, they're seizing upon climate change and green, green industries to sort of to be the path forward in those countries. And it's unfortunate that it, even even the mere suggestion of that in the U.S. right now seems to be politi political when it's when it's just I think a smart approach. Yeah. Um, but I would love to talk to Matt Gates if he's on board with anything <laughs> anything of that nature. To that point, you and I talked about the fact that um, you know there are there are parts of the Green New Deal that that you would otherwise think Republicans would love, and that you but they're they're dismissing it writ large because it's the, the messenger or it's, it's sort, of a, sort of seen as a progressive you know darling and um what is what do those prongs look like that we probably actually could get like, you know some good bipartisanship on yeah i mean it's so fascinating you, you know you asked me to to think about the greener deal prior to this conversation and i hadn't uh read it in a while and by the way everyone um Everyone should read it because it's only 14 pages. It's really <laughs> it's a resolution. Yeah, <laughs> it's a resolution. It's it's actually resolutions are pretty easy reading. You know? Yeah, they're not actually like it's 500 page point. bills. If that was a bill, it would be 5,000 pages. <laughs> right. But hey, it's a resolution. Yeah. And, and you know, so many people just wrote it off, as you said, and 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 crushed it. Um, and I'd be willing to bet a lot of people didn't read it. And one of the reasons, one of the things that infuriates me, uh, you hear a lot about the Green New Deal is they'll, you know, folks will say, you know, they want to get rid of airplanes, air travel and all that. And, and it's just like, come on, 14 pages. It doesn't say that anywhere in the Green New Deal, not, not even remotely close. Um, but with regard to this, this, um, you know, looking at the Green New Deal through the lens of um, the, the pandemic, it's, there, there, there are so many things like, um, you know, empowering, you know, communities that, that have been uh, historically disadvantaged, uh, you know, farming is a, is a great example, you know, in the Green New Deal, there's several lines that, that explicitly say, you know, we need to bring back, um, you know, localized farming, you know, localized businesses. This is, uh, you know, an argument you see a lot of times from the, from the conservative right, you know, that globalization has destroyed small town mm -hmm. America. Uh, and it says it right there in plain language in the Green New Deal that, th you know, through, um, you know, reinvigorating our economy with a, with a focus on um, different uh, energy approaches, you know, we want to focus on, on small town America, farmers and, and other uh, mm -hmm. historically disadvantaged communities. And that's, that's communities of color, that's, that's um, white rural communities. It, it, you know, speaking of, you know, the language of the, of the resolution, it, it certainly doesn't say anything about uh, airplanes going away, but it does explicitly, explicitly say, let's empower our disadvantaged communities. And, and I can't find anything more um, across the aisle than, than, than those types of, um, that type of verbiage. Or, or just infrastructure and, you know, weatherization projects, uh, you know, actual new jobs being created right and you know i think right now you know we're i saw a report yesterday the call the, the cost of a barrel of oil is currently zero dollars meaning they are they're paying people to take their oil because it costs more to, to build storage than it does just get rid of it and so you know this this weaning ourselves off of fossil fuel as quickly as possible um you know, at this current moment, it's not, it's, it's, it's worthless. <laughs> Where they're losing money because they have to give this away for basically free. Um, and you know, it's, we have to have, it'd be, it'd be irresponsible of our government not to engage in these conversations about how 
best to move forward with green industries, not necessarily taking advantage of the fact that these, you know, these fossil fuel industries are struggling, but the, the fact of the matter is we need to pivot and we need to do it as soon as possible. And I, I really don't see this as being an opportunistic. I think it's irresponsible not to have these conversations at the highest levels, to be yeah. quite frank. Um, but more to that point, I want to talk South Jersey specifically. We have one question um, that I want to address from one of the attendees. Um, but you and I have had an extensive, extensive conversation about you know, the Army Corps of Engineers um, and their comprehensive mitigation um, package um, that mostly, um, it, it's, it's all about the Jersey Shore and it's the, the base shore that's the, the focus of your book um, is excluded. Um, so I didn't want to dig into that and also address this question, you know, is, is the rise between now and 2015 linear or is the rate increasing? How much will it rise in New Jersey in 10 years? Um, so it's, it's not linear. Uh, so it has accelerated since, since 1990 quite a bit. I don't have the exact number on that. And I don't have the exact number of, you know, how, you know, it will unfold until 2050, but, uh, the evidence is clear that it has accelerated, um, since 1990 by a factor more than, than in the decades previous. So, you know, that's all baked into those projections of eight inches to two feet. Um, and again, it, it can't, couldn't possibly be linear because we have no idea, you know, how much carbon we're going to continue to spew um, on an annual basis. So, you know, if we, if, you know, if we, if we cut back, it, we could be on closer towards that eight inch mark. If we continue to, to produce more and more, um, then it'll be closer to that two foot mark. And then of course, there's other environmental factors that that you, you can't deny, you know, add into that, into that rise. Mm -hmm. um, but the important point is that, no, it's not linear. It's, it's accelerating and the evidence has, has clearly shown that since 1990. Thank you for that, Andrew. Thanks for that question, Ted. Um, so about the, 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 the risk mitigation package, because I, you know, this is something, it's another, I've, I have really awesome supporters <laughs> because they, they keep me educated. And this is a, um, an article that the Cape May Standard did uh, back in January, February about this report that since that has since come out it's in March, um, and it has been on, it's been on my radar. And then I was given this book, and sort of it's been top of mind. Um, and you know, some of the, the some of the plans that they would like to implement, uh, whether it be bulkheads, sea gates, um, you know, their projections are that if without it would be 10, it's a ten billion dollar plan. We can start there, but we, you know, in so much of this environmental space and the metrics of cost, um, cost benefit analysis, this plan would pay for itself. The projections show that it would prevent $1.7 billion worth of damage annually and essentially pay for itself in seven years. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about that because obviously the Bay Shore where you grew up and which, you know, in our county, not within that package. Um, would it have benefited from those same protections in that plan? Um, and sort of what, I guess, technologically, what would that uh, look like on the Jersey shore and potentially the Bay shore if it was implemented? Well, I mean, I think the, I think the short answer is that it, it certainly would benefit the Bay shore communities in the short term, just as it uh, will uh, benefit the, the Jersey shore communities in the short term. Um, and then, Another very important point is that, you know, at some point, all of the infrastructure in the world is not going to, uh, you know, stop a, say, six foot rise of water. Uh, I was just in the Netherlands um, last month. I got home, like, just under the radar from the, from the pandemic closures and all of that. Um, but I was there to, to tour um, their Delta Works and their infrastructure projects. And a lot of what they've implemented in the Netherlands is the inspiration for the New Jersey Back Bay study. So uh, massive sea gates, dike, um, these kinds of things, less bulkheads. But, um, you know, even the Dutch who are roundly considered the, the experts in, in sea level rise and flood mitigation admit that after, you know, six, seven, eight feet of rise, all bets are off, you know, and, and, and new 
even their best floodgates are not going to withstand, you mm -hmm. know, a storm surge on top of a rise like that. So, um, sure, you know, it, it, it'll benefit the communities, but then the question becomes, I, and I, I encounter this question a lot of times, is at what point does the intrinsic value of the shore sort of, and coastal living in general, um, erode to the point of it not being worth it anymore if, you know, your view of the ocean is blocked by a, by a giant, um, you know, seawall out, out in the ocean or, you know, so it's, it's, it's these questions, you know, that are inevitably going to, to um, become roadblocks in, the, in the, the, the implementation of any of these proposals in the New Jersey Back Bay study. Um, obviously, there's huge environmental concerns with all of them. So it's very much, and I stress very much, a, um, just a proposal, you know, a, a laying it all out on the table, throwing it at the wall and, and mm -hmm. seeing what, um, you know, how it's going to stick with, with uh, communities. In terms of the Bayshore, it's, they're, they're out. They're not even considered in this, in this plan. Yeah. Um, and that was, that was striking because you and I have talked about sort of, um, you know, these, as these calculations are made, it's, it's really done with cost benefit analysis and they've just determined the, the, it's not there with the Bay Shore, um, which is, you know, as, as a Cumberland County resident, we've always sort of felt like our county was always sort of thrown under the bus. <laughs> and then you see plans like this and it's like, oh, we are not even included. It's, this stops at the very tip of the <laughs> Cape, and, Cape May. Got it. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, yeah, it's a lot to take in. Um, but I know I, for me, and I, I will pivot to, to the book a little bit because what you just described are communities making hard choices and communities sort of coming up, a, you know, having to decide for themselves how long to fight and how long that fight is worth, um, how much that fight is worth. And what I found so immediately gripping about the book was sort of the human element and you sort of, you, know, you open with, um, and this is for hopefully people have started to read it if you haven't, we're not going to get super deep into the book, but this will give you a good preview to go buy it, read it, We'll have a longer conversation exclusively about the book in May. Um, but you talk about this couple, um, Mike and Kate. And, and what, one of the things that was immediately apparent was, you know, this, this is kind of, these are, it's a small, these are small town folks who know their community. And I don't imagine you would have been granted this access if you weren't one of them. <laughs> they, just, they, just, they just came across as sort of, you know, they talk to you so openly and there's so many great details um, especially sort of, you know, when you talk about asking your community to just forego and abandon, you know, what they know, what they love. There are generations of people like your family that have lived in these places. It's not as easy as just selling off a home to Blue Acres and, you know, picking up and leaving. You're leaving memories and you brought home this really vivid image of Mike and Kate. Um, you know, the, was it a pier? I think it was a pier in which they met on a fishing trip and then were they, were they also married there? Uh, yeah, yeah. They they met uh, building a house there in, in Bay Point where they where they lived and where they continue to live. So yeah, that they met on a construction project there. Yeah, in Bay Point. Yeah, and you bring that you bring that home throughout the first half of the book often, and it just it it always um, brings it back to sort of what's that, what's really what's this really about as humans and the communities they've built and the places and the memories they've created. Um, and sort of the this looming danger that that could all be taken away and has been for many of them. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about you know I I thought that was a, that was great, but also your own memories and there was a really vivid memory of you escaping a storm <laughs> as a young boy with your family. You want to tell tell the audience about that? Yes. <laughs> so um, it, it's funny. I had I had almost completely forgotten that until I returned to. Money Island, the, the subject of the book. Uh, I returned there after Hurricane Sandy uh, and, and had remembered while I was there surveying the damage from Sandy that, uh, that I had been there uh, once when I was a kid. Uh, Money Island's not that far away from where I grew up as the crow flies. It's about eight miles across the marsh. Um, and Growing up, my, my father, my brother, and I, we, we fished on the bay. That's, that's what we did all the time. And, and this, so this was in the late 80s. 
and the nineties fishing on the bay was actually uh, pretty good back then. Uh, we'd, we'd go week fishing and flounder fishing and all of that. And, and um, as anyone who's, who lives in South Jersey, whether you fish or not, actually today, for example, you know, violent storms come out of nowhere. Um, and so we were out there fishing one day, typical summer day, as we did almost every weekend back then. And one of these squalls came up and, and you know, caught us off guard. And, and my uncle realized that we couldn't make it back to the marina where he kept his boat. And the closest place that, that we could get to, um, the fastest place we could get to was Money Island. And I, I vividly remember him saying Money Island um, to my father, you know, as they were sort of deliberating where to go. And in a kid's eyes, you know, that a name like that is sort yeah. of cool. I, I, <laughs> you, think of, you think of the ducktails and sort of Papa Ducks jumping in a pile of money in the coins. Yeah, like, <laughs> like what, the hell is, what the hell is in Money Island? I can't wait to see this. You know? And, um, oh gosh, I remember, I remember that, that day so vividly and, and, you know, racing through the storm and, and, you know, pulling up to the dock and, um, there were, at the time there was a luncheonette built on the, on the main, um, the main dock there in Money, Money Island Marina. And I just remember being in the crowded luncheonette that day because it was filled with other fishermen that had been chased off the bay. And, um, I remember sitting there and some, someone gave my brother and I, you know, Coca-Cola's on the house or something like that. <laughs> and I just remember sitting there and looking out the window and seeing all of the, the shanties built along the shoreline. And, and um, you know, where I grew up was back off the marsh on a, on, in between fields. So we didn't grow up on the water, you know, in South Jersey, in, in the areas of the Bay Shore, there's miles of marshland between the mainland and, and the bay. So there's very few of these communities right on the water. So the only thing I had seen similar to that was on the Atlantic coast, you know, just going there, you know, with my, my parents playing on the beach in Ocean City. So this was like a really magical thing. I was like, holy smokes, like this, this community exists right near my house. And, and um, it just sort of always sat in my mind as I grew up, teenager, adult, it sat in my mind as a, as a special place and, and, um, you know, as I say in the book, and as I say, when I talk about the book, you know, doing the, the tour, you know, I never could have imagined that, you know, a place like that w would cease to, you know, would cease to exist, you know, in, within my lifetime. So. Yeah, and you do a, a great job of you know, painting the history of these places, right? Like, uh, I mean, it, two sides of history, right? Because these storms, um, are historic, and you you sort of paint a picture of sort of the what that what that is what that's looked like a timeline of storms that have devastated these communities, and one happening to Mike's dad in 1980. Um, but you also talk about sort of the the history of uh, you know industries that have been there, and the oyster industry, and the boom of you know Port Norris and other surrounding towns um, that have that invigorated the economy back then, and sort of still gives people hope that it that there is a chance for it to happen again, and um, you and I talked about this. I don't know if Tony is watching. Um, but it was really interesting because it's while I'm like I, you know, a, a supporter tells me about the book. I start reading it, and I hadn't yet gotten to a, the chapter that had Tony Novak in it. Um, and I, it's, in, it's funny had people who are sort of very politically involved in South Jersey. You tend, I, I, if you're running for office here, you go to these events. You start seeing the same people because they're really just active and they're out and about. And they want to meet folks who like me who are running. And um, I ended up, I was in Atlantic City, was, you know, I guess not, not terribly far from, uh, from Money Island, but um, the, the owner of, or I'm not sure if he still owns it, I imagine, I think he does, the Money Island Marina. Um, I met him after I gave a rally about in Atlantic City about their change of government vote. <laughs> like that had nothing to do with what was happening. Um, and I remember just talking, and I remember talking to, to Tony on the phone and I was he was telling me about you know that he had interest in you know Cumberland County and I was like well I'm reading this book and he's like I'm in that book I'm like oh okay <laughs> this is this is really funny this is a really small world it's South Jersey after all um but uh yeah it it, it for me it's been that's been the high, like one of the things I liked reading about it because having grown up here um and knowing that how forgotten it can be and the town you talk about Bridgeton and the Victorian homes you talk about you know, my hometown of Vineland and, uh, you know, the freeholders here in the state assembly, you know, Jeff Van Drew is in the book. Well, his, he's named in the book. His, his legislative a cameo. Very, very small cameo. 
<laughs> yeah, it's a small caveat. He's like a very minor character. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's why I've enjoyed it. But there is one chapter called uh, Drain the Swamp. Yes. And we kind of, we kind of talked about this because, uh, you know, sim similar to the mindsets of, you know, folks who don't realize there's you know, on the conservative side that the Green New Deal, there are, it's, there, there are policy proposals within it by which they would benefit. And that's directly um, there to assist them. Um, you had this interesting dichotomy happening with the, with the community of fishermen in Money Island because they obviously, they, you would think people who are closest to the looming crisis who are living on the water would be the, the least climate denier you, know, you could be, but that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's a complex um, issue that I that I wrestled with um, the entire time, and and you know, I I basically came to the conclusion that uh, what what's happening on the Bay Shore is 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 something that's happening in rural America um, writ large, and it a lot of times it has to do with regulation, and and what you see. Um, on the Bay Shore is the, the oyster industry there, which is, is really the sort of the, 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 the cultural um, shining moment of the Bay Shore. It was when you mentioned it earlier, you know, the, the oyster industry at one point in time was, was um, you know, Port Norris, you know, the, the hub of the, of the oyster industry had the most millionaires per square mile. Mm -hmm. Any other municipality in New Jersey, it was, it's, it's the shining moment um, in, in the Bayshore's time and its era. And that era extends far back beyond, um, you know, the founding of this country. And one of the first um, colonial regulations was, was on the oyster uh, fleet on the Bay. It was, to, it was to regulate catch, to, you know, to, to basically help the health of the, of the Bay stock. Mm -hmm. and, and so what you see over the years, you see various oyster wars where Bayshore oystermen are fighting against oystermen from Philadelphia uh, who are trying to come in and, and harvest their, their oysters. And then you see the government get involved um, and intercede in, in some sort of way. So what happens is, is um, you have centuries and decades of, of um, various government interventions and they don't always go the way um, of the fishermen in, mm -hmm. you know, in favor of the fishermen. And, and basically, I think what we had by um, 2016, certainly inflamed by the rhetoric of, uh, you know, candidate Trump at that time, was it was a real um, turning against regulation. And it was it was it became this this clear bullseye that that people could sort of, you know, pin and, and say, yes, that's this is why I'm in support of candidate Trump. And this is why I'm, you know, I'm against, you know, Hillary Clinton or whatever the Democrats mm -hmm. general so it's 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 a conflation of um, you know regulation and and what's happening with with climate and you know I think you and I discussed it as well a lot of the folks who are who are down there fishing you know you and me we have a lot of time in our days to read reports and catch up on you know scientific uh, journals and and talk to people and but if, if you're an everyday and person, yeah, we do have a lot of time to read. <laughs> I, don't know I, say, I, I, don't, I don't know about the non-pandemic times, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, we are, non, we are in pandemic time now. <laughs> but prior to that, um, I had too much time to read and, and climate <laughs> journalists, you know, all do. And, and, you know, a person who's working every day, um, trying to eke out a living, being a fisherman, you know, they're not, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, able to, to keep up on, you know, a very boring uh, science mm -hmm. journal report and things like that. So you really, the, the regulation has become sort of a, a boogeyman um, within the, the, the climate debate, certainly on the Bay Shore. Yeah, and that's, and that's sort of been conflated, right? It sounds, my understanding was that, you know, the, because there are, there are politicians who, who are very much in front, uh, you know, it's proponents of things like the Green New Deal, and I think of some of these, some of them, some fishermen on the conserv more conservative side just see another a new set of regulations to follow, um, um, which is unfortunate. Um, 
and that kind of opposition when it gets politicized, when it's, you know, lives are on the line, uh, economies are being destroyed and will, will no longer exist, um, you know, if action isn't taken. Um, and we have a lot of questions, so, so I want to be respectful of your time. Um, we just, we haven't even gotten to sort of, you know, there's so much more we can talk about in that first half of the book. Um, and I, I think we're, I think we will need a second conversation if you're okay with that, Andrew. <laughs> I would love to. Um, I, I need more time to finish the book, <laughs> first and foremost. But um, you know, we uh, some we there are a lot of questions coming in. There are probably six or seven that we probably I would like to address before seven o'clock. Um, yeah. We can, but you know, you and I discussed this about you know looking at our cost benefit analysis, and even even if you do take something that is heartless as sort of cold statistics like that, you know, your first half of the book, you twice you reference the fact that. Um, you know, the oyster industry is still alive and well in, in the Bay Shore. Um, and as a matter of fact, if you use the government, the, new, the government's calculation of sort of how to um, really determine profitability, and this industry is a sixty billion dollar industry in the Bay Shore, and would, which is most one of the most profitable sea, seafood ports in our state. And so, you know, to that, I want to. There's a question that came up about. Um, about sort of development and seacoast development and sort of, is it as simple as just, you know, moving back from seacoast development in terms of, you know, mitigation or eliminating risk? Uh, I mean, to, to stop the, the problem of, of um, properties being flooded and, and um, you know, the federal government being, being bankrupt, uh, yeah, it is, it is as simple as retreat. Uh, again, looking at those higher end projections beyond 2050, you know, when you start looking at those four feet of rise, six feet of rise, worst case scenarios by 2100, there's nothing um, that's being proposed or really that could be done to, to save these communities that are currently on the shoreline. Because the fact of the matter is the shoreline with that kind of rise is not the shoreline um, in the future, you know, our, our, our coastal, literally the map of the United States will look different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is as simple as, as just retreating back, but it becomes so tangled with, with history, with culture, obviously with politics and most importantly with economics. Um, you know, the Bay shore has been, an easy place for the state of New Jersey to implement its Blue Acres program because it's an economically depressed area. A lot of folks there were frankly ready to take the buyouts. Um, certainly less people like Tony, like Mike and Kate who were willing, they, they want to stay mm -hmm. and they have very good reasons to stay. But for every, uh, you know, Tony, Mike and Kate, there, there are others who are ready to leave. And when, when you're in an area, where your property value is plummeting, um, no one's coming in, the, the Army Corps is not investing in infrastructure like bulkheading that might give you a, a Band-Aid of an extra 10 years, something like that. Um, it's a lot easier to throw your hands up uh, and, and retreat. On the Jersey Coast, there's, you know, the state will do anything it can to, to preserve the Jersey Shore communities because, you know, the, I think the latest numbers for the, the tourism economy in Jersey is, is uh, 55 billion annually in tourism. And I think 25 billion of that comes directly out of the Jersey Shore, mm -hmm. um, the, the counties that, that have the Jersey Shore communities. So our entire economy <laughs> would, if not collapse, come very close to collapse without our Jersey Shore. So there's a lot of there's a lot of politics and there's a lot of um, emphasis on doing everything we can to, to preserve, you know, those barrier islands. And, and when you have so much energy going towards a coastline like that, inevitably the other coast, the forgotten coast is going to be just that it's going to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be invested in. And that's all propped up by, you know, the federal government's um, threshold for cost benefit analysis. Yeah. And this is, this is another thing. This is another parallel, a, a, an odd pandemic parallel, because in this discussion, I see, I see uh, 
the choices being made to retreat or to fight it out is also a choice being made in our pandemic, whether we continue to quarantine or whether we reopen the country, right? Yeah. And so it's, and people say this is, this is self-imposed uh, economic doom. And, it, and when we have part of the New Jersey economy that's so reliant and it's profitable um, on the Jersey shore and coastal tourism, you know, I don't, it's not uh, a, an easy pill to swallow to, to say that, okay, you guys just all need to retreat and abandon the barrier islands and uh, things of that nature. And that's, that's an economic analysis that people are making now. And the end, the answer becomes it's been, it's profitable right now. And people are thinking really short term about this. And, um, but it's not like, to your point and to the point that we made about the human element of your book, because it's not just as simple as uh, as retreating. You know, I don't blame anyone for not wanting to leave the site of their marriage or where the site of where they met the love of their life and you know, where they vacationed with their children when you know when their second home when schools were out. Like it's that is sad. It's a sad thing to have to think about an encounter and a sad choice to have to make. Um, and I don't, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, if there's anything, any lesson that can be, can be learned from what's occurred with Blue Acres, what's occurred in uh, the, the Bay Shore, um, you know, that, that the Jersey Shore could learn from, because it, it may not happen soon, but we can't deny that the sea levels are rising. We have, if that's happening, we have to reconcile it with the fact that that changes our Jersey Shore economy. Um, and yeah, it's difficult. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just add that um, I, I worry just like with anything that, that money drives the conclusion to the story. And I think there's two ways to do that. I think, I think there are ways to think very innovatively and in ways that, that we haven't um, thought about previously. You know, the, the Dutch again are very good at mitigating water. Um, they have a very good buyback program with, with people who, they, who they've already moved. And the, the truth is, is if, if, and we're talking about the shore communities at this point, if, if um, they stay as they are and they just sort of armor up as, you know, status quo, one day there's going to be a hurricane that's worse than Sandy. Certainly if sea level rises or even eight inches higher by 2050, um, that's going to devastate communities again. Um, it's going to devastate the National Flood Insurance Program if that's not uh, revamped to assess risk more accurately. And what we're going to have, maybe not at a national level, but certainly at a statewide level, is an economic crisis. And so I think the point that all of us in this sort of retreat conversation are constantly beating the drum about is that let's not just armor up in, a, in the status quo manner, but let's try to think innovatively uh, in ways that we can sort of move parts of communities and, and, and do a slow retreat rather than all hands on deck, throw your hands up, throw the white towel in the air and run, because mm -hmm. all that's going to do is cause a crisis. It's gonna cause a cultural crisis. Um, it's gonna cause a demographical crisis where mm -hmm. are people are gonna go to, and obviously it's gonna cause an economic crisis. And, and really, I think that's sort of the heart of the, the entire retreat debate is, is that we're all just trying to say, look, let's, let's acknowledge that the future is going to be different environmentally. And if we just acknowledge it, then we can start taking steps towards, um, you know, creating more resilient barrier islands. And maybe if we turn off the tap on CO2 and, and you know, everything, the tide turns on, on carbon dioxide and climate change and, and maybe that curve will start to get crushed, you know, like we talked yeah. about at the beginning. And at the end of the day, maybe some areas of the shore will be saved. It, it won't be um, anything that's localized at that point. It'll be a, you know, a global initiative. You know, mm -hmm. it, it definitely saving the Jersey Shore as it is now is certainly a global effort. <laughs> it yeah, takes no, all of us in this world um, to come together to save our, our coastlines. It's not just the Jersey coast, it's, it's all of our coastlines because life as we know it on our coasts are, are going to radically uh, be changed over the next century. And to that point, there's, an, there's another question. Um, do, 
do we, do we believe there's any potential technological breakthroughs to combat climate change in the works? Um, it sounds like, you know, from what we've been discussing, it's, um, it's the breakthrough would have to be just all hands on deck to, to flatten the curve. I mean, is there anything sort of miraculous beyond that? No, I mean, I, I don't think there's any, any sort of, um, miraculous thing that, that silver bullet, silver bullet. Yeah. Thank you. Um, you know, carbon, there's talk of carbon capture, but that's an energy intensive process. You know, it, we have no sil silver bullet here. We have no vaccine, right? The pan again, the pandemic has a vaccine eventually. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we, we have a vaccine, uh, certainly not in one single pill or shot. You know, it's, it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of things. It's going to take investment in renewables, uh, solar, you know, all of these things, some folks would, would argue for nuclear. I think the jury's out on that. And I don't mm -hmm. think I'd feel totally comfortable sort of get wading into those waters, but certainly that's something that's, that's in conversations. Um, so that again, the vaccine is not a shot. It's, it's a, it's a cocktail. And um, again, the first thing we need to do in order to even take a step towards finding that cocktail is just, uh, you know, across the aisle acceptance that, that there's a problem, certainly in this country, because we really are behind and every day we're falling further behind uh, with regard to just acknowledging that there's, that we have a problem on our hands. Yeah, and, and to that point, I think for, you know, we've seen it across the country and this ties into one of the other questions that came in. We've seen it around the world. You're seeing carbon emissions reduce, you're seeing pollu pollution go down. LA has the cleanest air it's had in recent history. Yeah. Um, and so I think one of the question on one of our audience members, how do we maintain something like that? Because obviously, you know, the whole goal is to, um, for folks to no longer be uh, at risk. And if there is a vaccine or, a, you know, an antibody tests that, you know, are given to every American and we go back to normal, um, the no normal for the environment was not very good. And so what, do, what, do you, what should we be doing to sort of maintain these you know, the environmental uh, benefits that we're seeing despite what's happening in this pandemic. Yeah, you know, I, I guess the short answer to that is just awareness, right? Remembering that, uh, remembering the pictures that we're seeing coming out of, out of India, you know, with, with incredibly clean air, images of, you know, LA. And, you know, unfortunately, I, I'm not sure I shouldn't say unfortunate because again, lives are being lost in this pandemic, but the, the fact of the matter is, um, you know, there are some environmental things that are happening right now that, you know, are positive in terms of the, you know, the smog clearing in the air and that, and that's, that, that can't be confused with, you know, carbon dioxide in the air. Those are two different things, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, we're not going to see once everything gets back to normal, um, certainly there's a risk that that countries are going to pollute even at a faster rate to get things you know, back, yeah. back going yeah. so i don't think this i don't think this break is going to have any kind of um lasting impact other than perhaps in our in our psyches and the way that we move forward and think about um this moment when really the world kind of came together to address a crisis and to think about think about it in more existential ways rather than concrete ways at this point mm -hmm. because I think it's, I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, what the majority of the world has done to, to come together and, and, and help one another and, and, you know, sacrifice their, their time that they enjoy outdoors, you know, for the, for the greater good. And, and these are all sort of existential philosophical things that we should probably be thinking about putting in our pockets and, and remembering for future crises. And certainly one of the most important future crises for us is, you know, uh, dealing with, with climate change related um, disaster. Yeah, no, I, I would, I would definitely agree. I think it's, I think we have to, like, as much as we need to, as much as we need to remember sort of what we're going through and to learn lessons, one of, this should be a lesson that's going to, that's learned. Um, and that, you know, no, we, the country should not have to go into a lockdown of this nature, but we need to be under, I think we, we're getting a really like a microcosm of what it looks like when, when we don't have as many cars on the street, when we don't have many planes in, this, in the sky, 
um, when we don't have this ongoing pollution, sort of what that, how it literally changes the way of the air, the air quality in a city looks around a country looks. And it happened in a matter of a month. Um, and so it's sort of just holding on to that. Um, there's two, if you have a few more minutes, there's two last yeah, questions sure. that come yep. in. Absolutely. Um, and one of them, uh, New Jersey has a leading solar power program, but it is still severely limited by Atlantic City Electric. What can be done to make South Jersey carbon neutral? Well, I, I first thing I would point to is the, the, uh, the Orsted Wind project off of Atlantic City. I think that's something that if, if the, um, you know, that you're, if you're not looking into, if you're not supporting, you, you definitely should look into it because that's a huge step. I forget how many millions of homes um, that that project could potentially power. Uh, and the other thing, I mean, yes, it's 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 unfortunate the way that power companies have a have a grip on on our communities with regard to how how we get power, and and that's again that's that's like a ballot box effort. You know what I mean? That's that's getting legislators to to um, introduce legislation that, that addresses these things and getting behind it and, and taking that and voting it and, and voting for change, um, you know, making, making noise about it essentially. Yeah, and I think that is, that ties into the, 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 other, the other question was about what can we do about irresponsible corporate behavior that contributes to climate catastrophe. And I think your answer, your answer is correct in that we, you know, we've seen, you know, with the BP oil spill and we, I mean, that's more of a pol water pollution issue, but you holding corporations to account. I mean, we, and for, for me, you know, in, in this race, people often ask sort of what, um, what committee do I want to work on? And did, in this context, the obvious answer would be, you know, environment or natural resources. Um, but I, I tell them that the oversight committee in Congress is one of the most powerful committees on the Capitol Hill. And it, that's because the jurisdiction is so broad. You know, I was chief counsel and senior policy uh, advisor for the economic and consumer policy subcommittee. We could have easily had an environmental hearing. We did not because there's also an environment subcommittee. <laughs> and, you know, and, and there were discussions. I, I was, my, one of, you know, people have like a work spouse. My work spouse um, ran, she, uh, she leads this oversight subcommittee on the environment. And so there, she and I had several conversations because it was obviously, you know, apparent to me how intertwined the two issues were. Like economic and consumer policy absolutely is dependent upon the environment and the protections and the actions we take. Um, and so for me, it's, it's a matter of really shining a light on those issues. I think it's a matter of having folks in this, having Senate leaders and a president that actually believes in climate change and understands the risk that's involved and that can move that ball forward, you know, doesn't hide climate and cl national climate studies. You know, I've seen it on, I've seen it, this administration have, they've, you know, annual reports that they, that did, they, they didn't like or they'd exclude the word climate change or they would, you know, bury reports to come out sort of uh, midnight on a Friday with sort of can't be any any real time reporting on it. Like these kinds of things don't, aren't, they're just not productive. Um, and, and, and so much of what we're talking about is building an awareness and making sure people have the information they need to really understand the, the drastic action we need to be taking. And we don't, and we have folks who are intentionally trying to, you know, make that harder to do. Um, and it's really unfortunate. Yeah, I, you know, it's a, it's a good point. And it, it goes back to the to the Army Corps of Engineer. You know, they you read that back bay study. Uh, you talk to them, and they they can't say in, in person or in the text. They they will they'll never say sea level rise. What they have is is sea level change, and they're very they're very careful about always saying sea level change. And just that that minor little uh, switch of the word um, sort of saves them a little bit. But the, but the point is that, you know, the, these folks working, you know, for these agencies, the, the career government employees, the, the evil deep, deep state, right, <laughs> who are just like good people, uh, middle class folks, you know, who have, you know, wanted to work in government their whole lives and want to make a difference. Um, a lot of them are still, and I think it's important to remember, they're still working from, from the inside um, with a mind towards climate change. 
Uh, and and it's, a, it's a real shame that their, their bosses, their, their politically appointed bosses are, are cutting against them. But the fact of the matter is these folks are still alive um, mm. back there in the shadows. And, you know, it hasn't, the rot hasn't seeped all the way oh. through. You're not talking about the, the deep state, are you? Not the deep state. <laughs> we are talking, we've gotten into, we've, we've moved into the second hour and now we're <laughs> <laughs> now the real people are on the people who know about the deep sea. They, they stayed on past seven o'clock. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, the you know, it's I see it in these reports, especially with the Army Corps of Engineers. You know, they they're working towards science. You know, they're they're working towards the facts still. Um, and you know, they're they're certainly being hindered by by the rhetoric that's coming out of the out of the top. But um, it's still there. So that you know. When we can have, you know, a, a more responsible president in the future, um, you know, we can maybe move back into addressing these things that are still living and breathing, you know, in, you know, inside the, the, the government agencies. So not yes. all hope is lost there. Yeah, that and, you know, for in terms of incentivizing, you know, green industries and, you know, or state, I'm so glad you brought that up. They had an open house um, back in February that in Atlantic City that I attended. Um, because I've always had an interest in, um, in wind energy and just clean energy in general. Um, and this goes back to, to I took a, a sales law course in law school and we had to, a lot of our, I, we were given weekly assignments based on a fictional um, uh, wind turbine company <laughs> and nego negotiating contracts, things like that. Um, and when I, so I saw sort of what was happening with Orsted and that they were sort of replicating efforts that from Block Island the, the wind farm off of uh, Rhode Island's coast, and that was initiated by a Brown alum, um, or Greg, I think it's Mike Grabowski. I have to look up his name, I think that's it. Um, and so that, it's, it's, I, it's funny because I brought, when I visited the Orsted Open House in Atlantic City, I brought that up and it was like, oh, you know, yeah, I'm, I, he's, I think he graduated 15 years before I, I did from Brown. But, you know, it's one of those things where we do need to, we need to, we need to incentivize the existence of those industries in our communities. Um, and one of the things that I, to bring it back home to sort of the, the, energy, the electric companies here in South Jersey, for me, I asked, you know, I asked them point blank, you know, how do we get around this narrative that the better, the more successful the wind energy is, the, the less successful, like is it, is it zero sum? Does that mean that our energy, uh, Atlantic City Electric or Vineland Municipal Electric, are they going to, to suffer because you exist. And they made it very clear to me that's not the case. As a matter of fact, it just makes, it makes the power to deliver more efficient and costs come down. And so, you know, and I, I think it's, it's getting those messages out there and making sure folks don't, um, you know, there's no misconstruence. It's really important. Yeah, I think it's, again, it's just, it's thinking innovatively. I think we're so stuck in, um, you know, old ways of capitalism and there's there there are ways to to rethink you know how how electric electricity is delivered for example like yes the the orsted wind farm is not going to power um all of new jersey you know no one's saying that that wind power alone is going to save us it's it's, it's going to take at this point at least um you know working together and that actually means in the interim you know, working with dirtier energy companies, you know, to get, you know, you can't just turn off all of the, the, um, you know, coal energy. plants or whatever, and, mm -hmm. and, and, and turn to wind. That's not how it works, you know, so, it, you know, if these companies can evolve and innovate, then all they're doing is helping themselves for longevity, because they're, Absolutely. you know, if, if, if you're just recalcitrant, and you don't, and you don't, evolve your mindset you're 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 going to wither away and you're going to be left behind and and really that's that's with humans and that's with industry and and, and that's that's what apparently that's supposed to be an underlying principle of capitalism right just to identify these opportunities and what needs to be done and i mean maybe the government needs to do a better job of incentivizing it um and giving some harder deadlines you know for for action but you know it's it's in all of our best interests it really is um yeah. And, you know, for I'm, I've we're, we've gone, we're hitting uh, 15 minutes beyond set the second hour, but I just want to thank you, Andrew, um, for joining. Um, anytime I can highlight, a, you know, a voice in our, in our community on such an important issue, I'm always going to jump at that chance. 
and you've been nothing but very accessible this entire time. Um, and I'm looking forward to a second conversation. Um, it could, I'm going to finish the book first, but we can, we'll have that second conversation. Oh, I, hope um, you, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, will. I mean, I haven't gotten to your, you said your, your favorite chapter is chapter 13. And I'm on chapter 10 right now. So yes. I will, I'll text you when I get there. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, appreciate it, Will. And, and definitely thank you to everyone who, who tuned in and, and asked questions. And also, I just want to say, you know, if you, if, if you have burning questions still and you want to email me, you know, go for it. I'm, I'm easy to find on, on the internet. So. Perfect. Um, yeah. And folks, if you didn't buy the book, you can, where can they get it, Andrew? Uh, you can still get it from indie bookstores online. Um, Amazon as well. Uh, Barnes and Noble has it online as well. So if you, if you just, again, go to my, my websites, it's Andrew S Lewis.com and it has buy links there from um online sellers if you don't want to buy from amazon there's there's other choices there as well obviously i would direct you to your local bookstore but not right now so yeah um yeah i think it's you know we tried to keep this conversation general because we understand sort of obviously and getting anything anything delivered right now there's it's a, it's delayed and um you know we really wanted to keep this broad based while t touching upon the book and so our goal is to have the next conversation be entirely about the book, have a much more participant interaction, actually having everyone else's face on the video and they can ask their own questions so, to Andrew and, and I. So with that, thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Andrew, thank you. Um, and everyone stay safe and well out there. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. Bye guys. Bye.